Welcome to our first <clears throat> Zoom session, and we'll be discussing Mendelian genetics from chapter three in your textbook. First, let me introduce myself, Dr. Camper, and um, I've been teaching genetics for a lot of years. Um, I want to say that the uh, lab syllabus and the lecture syllabus are both online, as is an introductory uh, a little uh, unit without any audio. And I expect you to have a working knowledge of terms like uh, genotype, phenotype, gene, and allele, and diploid and haploid, etc. That material you should have been introduced to in um, Biology 105 or some other uh, introductory biology course if you are a transfer student. Uh, transmission genetics refers to the transmission of traits from one generation to the next. So in this uh, unit we'll be concentrating a lot on phenotypes and their underlying genotypes. And as soon as I can figure out how to get to the next slide, we will do so. Um, I'm going to have to pause things for these technical difficulties. Be right back. Okay, this is a picture of Gregor Mendel. The hero of our story, he was a monk in the present-day Bruno, uh, present-day city of Bruno in the Czech Republic in Europe. And he did a lot of his research from the uh, late 1850s through the mid-1860s. And he liked both mathematics and agriculture, so he bred these pea plants and kept careful track of uh, um, transmission of traits from one generation to the next. This is a history of some important findings in genetics. You can see when Mendel did his work, he published it first in 1866, as we can see down the lower left. Very little was known about biology in general, and so Mendel didn't know about DNA, chromosomes, genes or alleles, or even genotypes. All he knew was he may have known about cells, and that was about it. So an outline for this unit, we'll talk about the theory of segregation and how alleles interact and form the phenotypes, then Mendel's theory of independent assortment, then a little bit of probability for mathematics, then multi-hybrid crosses. So Mendel's research organism was the tartan pea, Pisum sativum, and it's a monoecious plant where each uh, flower has both the female part, the carpal, and the male part, the stamen, and this allowed Mendel to control which flowers fertilized which other flowers or which plants fertilized which other plants. These are the traits that Mendel studies, seven traits in all. And interestingly, <clears throat> and I've often wondered if he did this on purpose or if this was just be luck, but all the, these traits are qualitative traits, either or traits and not quantitative traits. The flower position or inflorescence is a, uh, whether all the flowers are at the end of the uh, stem or they come out uh, along with the leaves at various places along the stem. The seed coat color, gray comes from purple flowers and white seed coats come from white flowers. Purple being the dominant trait, white recessive. So, we looked at seven traits. Peas are two and equals 14, meaning they have a haploid set of seven chromosomes. However, not the traits were not distributed, one per chromosome, but chromosome number one had the traits for seed color and for seed coat color or flower color, that's the same trait, same gene. Chromosome number four had the genes for pod shape, plant height, 
and the position of the flowers are in fluorescence. Chromosome five has the gene for pod color, either yellow or green. Chromosome seven has a gene for seed shape, and that's either uh, round or wrinkly. And then chromosomes two, three, and six had none of the genes that Mendel was studying. So Mendel's theory of segregation, sometimes called Mendel's first law, or Mendel's law of segregation, states that diploid organisms inherit two genes per trait, and each gene segregates from the other during meiosis such that each gamete will get only one gene per trait. So it's kind of a description of how the alleles separate during meiosis. So here's a uh, pair of homologous chromosomes with a heterozygous genotype, big R, little r. So the chromosome containing the big R allele in black there came from one parent, say the mother, and the other chromosome containing the white allele or the little r allele came from the other parent or the father. So this would be genotype big R, little r. And these two R's would be separated during meiosis. And the daughter cells would end up with just a single chromosome with either a big R or a little r. This shows segregation that results from the separation of homologous chromosomes during meiosis. So on the left here is with no crossing over. First of all, at the top we have unduplicated chromosomes. Again, our genotype is big R, little r. They go through DNA replication, which makes the chromosomes duplicated, and now each chromosome has two chromatids, hence their X-like shape. So now there's two copies of the big R gene and two copies of the little r allele. And so with no crossing over then, we really get two types of gametes, those carrying big R, those carrying little r. With crossing over, which is the more common and normal uh, circumstance, we end up with um, unique combinations of alleles. As we can see here, um, at the end of meiosis now we have four different genetically unique gametes. Those with uh, big R on the red chromosome, those with big R on the blue chromosome, those with little r on the blue chromosome, and those with little r on the red chromosome. And this shows how Mendel conducted his crosses. Uh, this is known as a monohybrid cross where we're looking at just one trait in this instance flower color. So he's able to cut off the stamens from the from or the anthers from one flower, uh, thereby effectively castrating it. And then he takes pollen from a different flower and fertilizes that castrated flower. And so now he's controlled who the male parent is as well as the female parent. And then of course the peas develop their seeds, which get planted and they grow up into the next generation and we can see what the uh, trait, the phenotypic trait is. In this case, all the flowers are purple, just like the parents. Now in a monohybrid cross like this, the P generation is the parental generation. So here we're crossing those that are plants that are homozygous to produce round seeds with plants that are homozygous to produce wrinkled seeds. We see in the F1 generation or the first filial generation, all the plants produce seeds that are round. So the uh, wrinkled seed trait seems to have disappeared. But if we cross the F1 plants with one another or do self-fertilization, which plants can do, we see that in the F2 generation, about three quarters of the plants show the round phenotype and about one quarter show the wrinkled phenotype. So that one the wrinkled phenotype um, disappeared in the F1 generation, but it shows up in a quarter of the plants in the F2 generation. And this shows how uh, a monohybrid cross is conducted and also how we get the characteristic F2 phenotypic ratio for a monohybrid cross with complete dominance, which is three to one, meaning three quarters of the offspring show the dominant trait in this case, purple flowers coded for the allele big A, and one quarter show the recessive trait coded for the recessive allele little a. So that's the results of a monohybrid cross with complete dominance. Now we're going to talk about how alleles interact to determine the phenotype. 
What we just saw was what's called complete dominance, where a dominant allele completely masks the expression of a recessive allele. We just saw that with purple flowers, purple being the dominant trait, white being the recessive trait. We can also be incomplete or partial dominance, where the heterozygote show an intermediate phenotype between either homozygote. So here we can identify the genotype of the organism based on its phenotype. And then there's also codominance, where both alleles are expressed in heterozygotes. And we'll look at some examples of each of these. Complete dominance, with a one locus is another term for gene, so one gene or locus to allele system, we get two phenotypes. The homozygous dominant and the heterozygotes both show the same phenotype. So if we're talking about the purple flowers and the pea plants, both Big A, big A, and big A little plants will have purple flowers. And then the homozygous recessive, little a, little a, uh, shows a different phenotype. And in the case of the plants and the flower color, that would be white. And so this gives us this characteristic three to one F2 phenotypic ratio, which means three quarters of the offspring show the dominant phenotype, one quarter the recessive phenotype. And that's a great example. This is tongue rolling where you, so most people can curl up their tongue by curling up the sides, but some people are not capable of doing so, and those that cannot are homozygous recessive. It's not a learned behavior. You can do it or you cannot. And it's denoted by Leo's big R for tongue rolling, little r uh, for uh, the inability to roll the tongue. Now, an incomplete dominance in a one gene, two allele system, this shows three phenotypes. The heterozygote has an intermediate phenotype, and it shows a one to two to one phenotypic ratio. We know that the one, the first one is for one quarter for uh, homozygous individuals, the two is for one half for heterozygotes, and the other one is one quarter for the other homozygote. So some plants called snapdragons, they have a allele that produces red pigment, and a, another allele that uh, the recessive allele doesn't produce any pigment, so the flowers end up being white. So here we are. This shows a homozygous red plant crossed with a homozygous white plant. The heterozygotes are all big A, little a in genotype, and they are pink because they have half as much uh, red pigment as the big A, big A plants. And of course, when you dilute red with white, you get pink. So this is incomplete dominance in these snapdragon flowers. Also, the, these um, spotted horses are the result of incomplete dominance. They are heterozygotes as well. Sometimes what appears to be <clears throat> one allelic interaction at the phenotypic level turns out to be a different one at the biochemical level. The example we'll use is a disease in humans called Tay-Sachs disease. Results from a defective enzyme called hexosaminidase A, and people that are homozygous for this defect die of the degeneration of their nervous system by the time they are only three years old. But it turns out heterozygotes, being a little a, appear to be totally normal people, but they really only have half the level of the hexosaminidase A enzyme. However, that's enough to, to uh, keep their uh, nervous systems functioning normally. So the biochemical level, they are uh, a different phenotype, but at the uh, gross level, they are the same phenotype. Okay, codominance, both alleles are expressed in the heterozygote. Great example of this comes from the ABO blood group system, where alleles A and B are codominant, but both of those are dominant to allele O. And so ABO, I'm sorry, AB blood, uh, people with that blood type, their red, red blood cells have both type A and type B cell surface proteins on them, so they are the uh, universal acceptor in terms of blood donation. This is also called a multiple allele system because you know, one individual can have all alleles because we are diploid, so only two copies of the gene, and there are three alleles. It shows you interactions. 
So the official allelic designation is a capital I with a superscript big A for type A blood or big B for type B blood and a small I for type O blood. So people type A and B blood can be homozygous or heterozygous, um, having the O allele. And people with type A, B blood, of course, are only heterozygotes, and people with type O blood are homozygous recessives. And this little table here um, is a review of those three uh, allelic interactions that we just discussed. Right out of your textbook. And now on to Mendel's theory of independent assortment, or Mendel's second law. And this states that each gene pair tends to sort into gametes independently of other gene pairs located on non-homologous chromosomes. And we study this using dihybrid crosses where we look at two traits and not just one trait. And this shows a typical nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio in the F2 generation. So this shows how two genes, A and B can uh, segregate during meiosis to form uh, four different gamete types, all in approximately equal numbers. So a quarter will be big A, big B, a quarter will be big A, little B, then a quarter will be big A, little B, and a quarter will be little A, big B. And this is merely all the types we can, all the ways we can arrange a capital A and a small uh, B and a capital B and a capital A, et cetera, together. So let's review some different crosses then. A monohybrid cross is defined as contrasting forms of one trait. The hybrid cross, we're crossing individuals with contrasting forms of two traits. Back cross is defined as crossing progeny with parents or those with uh, the parental genotype. Test cross is a back cross with a tester, which is a homozygous recessive individual. And we'll be discussing monohybrid test crosses and back um, dihybrid test crosses. Now on to the mathematics. So in mathematics, uh, probability theory is given by a simple formula P equals A over N, where P is a probability of our desired outcome. A is the actual desired outcome, and for us that's normally going to be the number one. And then N is all possible outcomes. And that's the number we have to figure out. Sometimes it's very easy and sometimes it's a little more complicated depending on the situation, the type of cross we're working with. So, and if there are compound events, that is we want to know something like a genotype and the sex of an individual, we have to figure two, two probabilities and multiply those together to get the final outcome or the final answer. So, here using a Punnett square, here's a problem, we're asking what's the probability of getting a homozygous recessive individual from a mating of two heterozygotes? Well, each heterozygote produces roughly half their gametes with the big A and half with the little A, and we see they can fertilize in four different ways, those four different boxes, so our N is four, and we're interested in only one of those boxes, right, those that have the genotype little a, little a in it, and so our Answer is one fourth, one over four. But if we're asked, what's the probability of getting in a daughter that is homozygous recessive? So now we have two things we have the genotype and the sex of the offspring to um, deal with. And so, as we saw from the previous slide, uh, the probability for getting an AA individual is one quarter and the probability of getting a daughter is one half, one over two, since there's only two sexes available, a half time and a quarter is one eighth. So the probability of getting a daughter that is little a, little a is one eighth from this type of a mating. We can look at this with uh, die. So the probability of rolling a four in a die is one over six because a die has six sides and only one of those sides has a four on it. Now the probability of ro rolling two fours in a row would be one six times one six, so one thirty-six, a much smaller number because it's less likely to happen, of course. And the addition rule is for when we want one 
of two possible outcomes. In this case, probability of rolling a three or a four is a sixth plus a six or two six or one third. Now, multi-hybrid crosses are crosses where we're dealing with more than two traits. That means three, four, or more traits, or genes. And these become too big and unwieldy for Punnett squares, so we use these little formulas as shortcuts. For instance, the number of gamete classes is two to the n, where n is the number of genes. So if we're working with three genes, say a, b, and c, and we have an individual that's a tri-hybrid, that is big A, little a, big B, little b, and big C, little c genotype, then they would have two to the third or eight possible gamete classes. The proportion of homozygous recessives in the F2 generation is one over two to the n squared, again, where n is the number of genes we're working with. The number of F2 phenotypes is two to the n, and the number of F2 genotypes is three to the n. So these are some formulas that are nice little shortcuts for doing um, multi-hybrid crosses. Let's review our phenotypic ratios, and if I were you, I would make a, a little index card with all these on there and keep it in front of you when you're doing your problems, and that will help you learn them because you'll need to know them for exams. So a three to one ratio is a monohybrid cross with complete dominance. One to one ratio means Equal numbers in each is a monohybrid test cross. One to two to one, monohybrid cross with incomplete dominance. A two to one ratio is a monohybrid cross with lethal alleles, which we haven't discussed yet, but we will soon. A dihybrid cross with complete dominance yields a nine through three one ratio. A dihybrid test cross yields a one to one to one to one ratio. In other words, four uh, phenotypic categories all in about equal numbers. 9, 3 to 4, 13 to 3, 9 to 7, 12 to 4, 15 to 1, etc. Our dihybrid crosses showing a type of genic interaction called epistasis that we will talk about in chapter 5. Mm -hmm. And the problems I'd like you to do for this chapter are problem 20, 28, and 31, and I will email you when they are due. Thank you.